Good. I just accidentally unplugged the computer. Hey, Garnet. Oh, here we go. Hey, we're back. Hi. Check, check. There we go. Okay. Can you send me that link, Dropbox link? Oh, of course. Oh, wow. So I was turning the computer around to show you the screen, and I unplugged <laughs> it. Oh, unplugged something? <laughs> I unplugged the computer. So... Oh, there we go. Yes. Let's start downloading that again. No, I'm just sending you individual clips so it doesn't, uh, you're not doing anything, downloading anything you don't need. I went quickly into um, the yoga room and I brought in a smoke machine. Okay. Um, and okay, I'm downloading and Nightmare Web. Okay. So I have a couple laser beams and I can get one more. 
And if you can run the shift play. Those all, yeah, they're all separate. So okay. these laser beams can shoot a single shot. And just so you guys know, for safety, these will cause blindness. Okay. If you this is B A T B. They're really, really strong. So I'm going to say safety behind this. Yeah, go ahead and play. Tunnel. By the way, that was a that was a cool. I like that fight sequence that I previewed before. That was pretty cool. Oh, good. So the students are there. Like yeah, here. we're just uh, through. We were just doing just before class. We were doing a practical uh, test um, on that screenplay we sent you. There's sort of the opening scene is. A girl dodging laser beam security system, yeah. system or something like that. Yeah. So we just went and shot a little sample with the room fogged and what the laser beams look like, and was, and they look they look good. Obviously, it's sort of contrast of getting light on the actor and having the laser beam show up too. So. Yeah, that's a tough uh, balance. <laughs> you need some bright lasers. Oh yeah. Um, and okay, so the last oh the last link you sent me was all of them. So yeah, all the So there was three yeah. or four, right? Should be four clips. Yeah. And then one folder with the same right. stills I have here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so those are downloading. They're taking their time. Um, so just hang hang with us while we sure thing. get started here. See this one? Or you can send one other clip. What about our clip okay. as well? So under it? Um, I want to keep them low. I prefer somebody going over it than under it because if somebody gets their yeah, so it doesn't say it crosses across their face. See if there are also um, there's a possibility of doing something like this. Um, there's a little adapter that makes patterns, and we could smoke up the room a little bit more, potentially getting some laser beams coming from above. But what I thought too, and the two directors think about this, is maybe the person who comes in has a little device in their pocket, boop, 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 boop. laser beams on the floor turn off. Maybe all of them turn off, yeah. and then they can just cross over the other ones. Um, but that's our that's a down and dirty test potential for you guys to use. And then we just have to consider where, what room we're going to film this in because we are going to smoke up the room, you know, whether it's this room or not. But the smoke is pretty contained down there. I can see a little bit out in the hallway. It was pretty contained. So there you what go. What room is she supposed to be? So we're bringing it to your office. office. Could we use so where that? Can even we could can make it by an office. It's quite small, though. Can we put our um, smoke in portable? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted you guys to see this today, just so you could start with a little wheel turning. That looks good. Yeah, and that was just with one light. We had the lights, the overhead lights off, and one light sort of pointing up towards the ceiling, just for if you can't do it with complete darkness, the camera won't pick it up. But with a little bit of light, you can still read it, and then you keep your smoke nice and light and even, and then it interacts with the people a little bit. But these are them. I'm gonna keep these. So when we get working up here, probably after spring break, we'll get into this kind of thing. That's why I wanted to show you guys a test today. So are, are we missing anybody today? No, everybody's here. Everybody's here. Oh, awesome, awesome. Okay. Oh, well, um, we're missing Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah, just kind of Rebecca. Where is Rebecca? Oh, yeah. She didn't go to Mexico again, did she? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. Now I'm on, I'm on LearnNet. Now I need to be on StaffNet. Gregor. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I need to be on a different <laughs> network here in order to broadcast this onto our screen. Okay. Do you want to disconnect I, and re-invite me? 
Yeah, well, let's see what happens. I'm going to attempt to switch. If we lose our connection, oh, okay. I, I will send a new invite, okay? Let's we'll see what happens here. And switching. Hopefully, this will be a technological miracle to keep this connection. It actually looks pretty good. Are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Cool. Okay. Um, we are now all right. Yay. We are broadcasting. So, so um, first of all, I guess before I introduce you, you know, your your name on IMDb credits has this sort of mysterious D. Gregor Hagee. What <laughs> what do your friends call you? Uh, oh, well, Gregor. Uh, oh, Gregor. Yeah. Gregor. Yeah. Okay. It's a little oh, reverb there. Yeah. Let me just switch sound back here, and we're back. Cool. Okay, so it's Gregor. I don't go by my first name. It's just uh, my I share my first name with my father, so I just go by my middle name. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen of Delta Film Academy, with us today via the miraculous power of Google and our bandwidth is Gregor. And I've hyped this guy before. I've already told them about your career. We've looked at some of your shots already, so oh. we're pumped to, <laughs> to you know, I, basically what we're going to do today is break this into three parts. So, you know, part A, and what I would do is have your, I'd like you to have your notebooks out because anytime someone is like sharing you, especially not just general information, but he's going to be going into technique as we look at some of these photos, especially for you guys in the camera department. You guys should be writing down this stuff because this is going to be pure gold today. Okay, so grab your notebooks, grab a pen before we get ready to rock and roll here. Okay. Let's see if I can get you the full screen. Full screen. Full screen. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's looking good. Okay. And um, we will we'll have a time for questions. So as as Gregor is talking and something that comes to mind that you want to ask, just sort of remember, right? jot a note down, something like that. So without further ado, this is Gregor, and let's, let's go to that question of when you first caught this spark of photography, when, when was it that you really realized that? How did, how did this all begin? Um, well, my interest in filmmaking began um, probably when I, was, I think I was 13, maybe. My father bought a home video camera, so uh, like any kid, I just started shooting silly little films, and uh, I, I started, you know, just self-taught shooting and editing, and um, went through high school that way, kind of uh, scamming my way out of writing essays by shooting films instead. Um, and then uh, I decided to go to film school at Ryerson in Toronto. And so I moved to Toronto and I wanted to be a director. Um, but I was definitely a guy, I am pretty uh, tech savvy. I'm, I'm definitely... Um, got a bit of an engineer inside of me, so I I just naturally gravitated towards shooting a lot of my classmates' projects. And then I had this, um, midway through film school, I, I was a production assistant on a, a film called Searching for Bobby Fisher, and uh, the late Conrad Hall was the uh, DOP on that. And that just totally um, blew my mind when I saw him at work. I just... Like, I, I just didn't, uh, you know, realize how creative um, a cinematographer can be. And um, so that just kind of, you know, started me down the path of uh, pursuing cinematography. Um, and, you know, 
So, so when you were going to Ryerson, what were what were the tools? Like, what kind of cameras were they teaching? Was it film or video? Uh, yeah, it was it was film. I mean, I grew up shooting video, uh, like <laughs> Betamax <laughs> video yep. in the eighties, um, and then. Uh, there was some video at Ryerson. We had uh, Video 8, I think, and some Betacam, but mostly it was film. They made you shoot 16 mil. You shot seven, seven little black and white shorts in, in your one, and you just dove right in. They gave you a light meter, or you didn't have a film. It was, um, and everyone had to do it. So it was, it was, it was an interesting program for the time. Uh, it, it, it's not, you know, I, I, they don't do that anymore. I'm certain, but at the time, it was cool. They had their own lab at Ryerson, so you'd shoot your little films on a. It was a Bell and Howell 70 DR, which is like looks like a little World War II camera, has daylight spools, and it only have hold a hundred feet of film. Um, which is uh, 100 feet is like about two and a half minutes in 16 mil. I think it's two minutes, 40 seconds. Wow. So you had to be pretty precise about what you were shooting. You know, if you only got two minutes <laughs> before you had to reload. And that film, and that roll probably cost you in purchasing and processing and printing like maybe 50, 60 bucks. Maybe, I don't know, at the time. So it adds up. So these guys are pretty spoiled to be able to have full HD monitoring of their yeah video very different as they're shooting <laughs> yeah so yeah, I mean th that which is great too though I mean it's nice to be able to see exactly what you're getting while you're getting it <laughs> was well sometimes I think like you know we we have certain exposure tools and I look at um, you know, some of the new monitors, like with false color and things like that, and I'm like, well, n no wonder the pro guys get great exposure because they have all these tools that, you know, almost like yeah. a 12-year-old can expose an image properly when you have these great, great, you know, the, the more expensive tools, right? Yeah. It, certainly exposure is was more of a... A problem, or you know, you know, a sign of a professional who's always, you know, you're always exposing your neg neg well. In the film days with uh, digital, um, you know, you don't have to worry, especially now with today's cameras. It's not so much about exposure; it's more just pushing the style and and um, you know, pushing the creative side of it more. Um, if if you if you let it, I mean, you can get hung up on a lot of other technical things with digital cameras. They're far more complex and complicated than film ever was. Um, so, you know, you can go down that rabbit hole and be, uh, you know, pick apart the menus as much as you want and the post-process. And you, you really have to be very computer savvy now um, to, to stay... Uh, you know, up to date with today's cameras and software. It's all about software. So let's skip ahead to sort of the first major gig, I guess, in your mind, where you transition to that deep, you know, director of photography role. What, what was that in your mind? The first, um, hmm. <laughs> well, it's always nice to get paid. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the first work I started getting paid on was uh, reality TV um, and then documentaries. Um, you know, consistently getting paid. Uh, that same year, I also shot my first feature film. It's a film called Bad Days, a very low-budget project, uh, which didn't actually get released in the end, but um, it, was a, it was a great working experience. Um, but, uh, I think, you know, when you start shooting, you know, projects that are signed to the union, you know, you've got, 
you know, a fleet of trucks and a, you know, an army of people, and you know, then then you kind of feel like you're really able to do your job. Uh, that's that's not to say that you can't do your job with just yourself and a camera assistant and you know a little case of lights. Uh, I do many. I have done many projects that way, and uh, I probably still will. You know, as they come up, but. Um, I would say the first um, TV show I really liked shooting was The Yard, um, which was about five years ago, I think. And that was, uh, it was shot in a mock documentary style. And uh, it's about, it was this f funny conceit. It just followed a bunch of kids who are in grades six and under, basically elementary school, in the, in the schoolyard. It just took place in the schoolyard. Oh, the kids yeah. kind of behave like different gangs. It was yes. like The Wire in a little bit. Um, kind of like The Wire meets South Park. So it was yeah. pretty funny. Kids were swearing and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> were kind of treated to like crack cocaine so they had to smuggle them in. And it, it was a very clever show. I saw um, the commercial for that. It, it looked hilarious. Yeah, it was, it was good. Um, re regrettably, the studio exec that greenlit it um, left that network, so when it came time for renewal, the new network executive, uh, there was no support for the show, <laughs> the politics. Politics, basically, uh, it got cancelled, so. But that's, uh, that's TV. Um, so that and, was the first yeah. network job as director of photography? Yeah, for like a, a dramatic uh, TV show, yeah. yeah. And then Beauty and the Beast came how, how far after that? Well, I shot season one of Beauty and the Beast in 2012-2013, and that was my first U.S. network show, um, which was great. It was uh, a big uh, step up production value-wise, just a lot more resources, much better sets. Um, it's, it's really important... Um, you know, the art department really dictates so much of the production value uh, in a show. And as much as, you know, you can control with lighting and lenses and uh, camera movement, you're, you know, what the production designer can uh, do and, and does uh, can really limit you or open up a lot of possibilities. And on Beauty and the Beast, that was like the first show where you know, I was working with an art department that could just build these fantastic sets and, you know, we could shoot these amazing scenes and it was great. I mean, writing aside, I don't know if anyone's seen the show, but it's not really my taste of a show to watch, but it was fun, certainly fun to shoot. It was great, great for uh, cinematography. So, let's, let's say, what was, um, maybe we'll start with your most you know, whether it's Beauty and the Beast or, or another show, what do you think was the most challenging situation or maybe even your worst day on set or something like that? <laughs> and then we'll go to your funnest oh, yeah. day on set. Um, well, there was certainly some very challenging days on Beauty and the Beast. It was a very challenging show with uh, a lot of top-down pressure. Uh, from LA and locally in Toronto, it was it was uh, very challenging, very high expectations. There's one um, scene. Uh, there's a character that goes down into the sewers to look for Vincent, who's the Beast, um, and she brings. She's a cop. She's actually friends uh, with Catherine, who's. Uh, Anyways, the, the, romant, the female romantic lead, and they're cops together. So anyway, she goes down with two other cops that turn out who are, are secretly bad cops, and she figures it out, and they try to kill her, so there's a chase through a tunnel, and then she gets cornered in a dead end, and she gets shot, and she falls into this sluice, this, you know, and falls into the water and goes into the water and then falls into, like, a pipe and gets stuck, and... The water fills up, she almost drowns, and then Vincent shows up and, you know, breaks open the uh, sewer grate so she can get out, 
just before she drowns and uh, thereby kind of redeems himself in her, you know, in her eyes by saving her. She was going down there to catch him. Anyways, I, I mean, I it's easy. It, you know, it's not so hard to describe that sequence, but to shoot that sequence is involved uh, about four different sets and uh, probably three days of shooting. So it was it was very involved, and um, there there was a lot of stress going on <laughs> for some of it, especially the, uh, the the tricky part was when she falls into the final pipe. She kind of gets shot, and she falls into water and gets dragged away. And then she falls into a pipe and almost drowns. And so how do you shoot someone almost drowning in a pipe? Um, so what we did is we... Uh, I could share some pictures, but... Uh, you know, there's tunnel sets that were built, and one of them had... Um, special effects had built a large... Uh, bin full of water... I don't know how it opened. It opened up somehow, and then that went into a pipe and created this uh, river, this sewer river thing that she's going to fall into and get washed away. But you could only like dump that, and it only ran for like a, like a minute or something, or a minute or two. It wasn't like so you had to get the shot, and then the, there was a big reset. Yeah, it was like I don't know. It was like this. I know what it was. It was like this device. You know, you ever seen uh, planes that drop um, water on a forest fire? Yeah. Yeah, the water bomb bucket. Yeah, the water. It's like these buckets that open up that helicopters carry. So they had that, and I would open up and go down a chute, and then she would have to fall into it, and she had a harness on, and she was pulled under. Well, she fell in, and then we did other takes with a stunt person. They were she can't pull the actress under water, and she had to get pulled underwater through a pipe and disappear from shots. So it was kind of it was a little scary. <laughs> But then there was another set built in a tank that had a, a vertical pipe. And we built a trap door at the bottom so the actress could go in and under. And then to simulate the water rising, we removed sections of the pipe so the pipe would get lower and lower. So um, there was a top piece to the pipe with a sewer grate and a floor panel. So we had a crane up there. You know, looking down through the, pipe, the the grating, and so at first it looked like the pipe. You know, she was like eight eight feet away from lens, and then as we removed piece after piece, this floor piece went closer to her. So it kind of looked like she's floating up towards the top, and right. she just kind of mime. She's still standing on the ground, but she kind of mime like the you know. Yeah. It's only four feet of water, so she'd crouch down and just kind of pretend to drown. And we'd be dumping water on her because it's filling up. And, uh, she got a little freaked out, actually. But <laughs> we, and I think we have a clip of that too. That would. Yes, I, there should be a clip of that, and uh, I can send you a clip where you can see one of the pieces being removed by this. There's this whole truss system built with a crane. We had the key rigger from Pacific Rim come in and and build it. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but. Um, for him, it was a small rig. For me, it was a big rig. <laughs> uh, so needless to say, there was a lot of pressure on you, and you were trying what, not yeah, to have those, your yeah. actor get killed and stuff. Yeah, the, uh, the yeah the powers that be were very concerned that uh, you know we were going a little slow in the beginning, but it's all about the setup and making sure everything's safe. And then once you're going, you're going and. Um, yeah, they were stressed. They were worried that they, if we didn't get the sequence working, then the powers that be in LA would be very upset. So it was kind of a, <laughs> you know, but we delivered. They were very happy, very happy with the sequence. I think it turned out really well. And and all of this trouble because some writer was sitting in his room, types oh, yeah. out a little paragraph that he thought was yeah. cool. Yeah. And it becomes you your worst. Write it. It's easy to write it. <laughs> I yeah, I bumped up against that a lot, on, especially in that show. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Writers need to hang out on set more. <laughs> okay, let's go to. I don't know the best, funnest day or funniest day or 
Is there a time you remember laughing the hardest on set? Um, well, there's a show called Sunny Side that I had a lot of fun on. Con I mean, definitely comedies. Uh, so there's a series called Sunny Side on Rogers City that uh, I shot last September, October in Winnipeg. I had a ton of fun on that, just in general. But I would probably say, like, the most... Um, there's a, a feature film called Suck that I shot, and it was it's like a rock and roll movie with uh, a band that's on tour that uh, instead of uh, you know one of the band members, it, it's kind of a metaphor for heroin, but she gets takes up with a vampire becomes a vampire slowly but surely all the band members start becoming vampires, and they can't stop drinking blood, so it's um, it had uh, a bunch of cool uh, musicians in it. There was Iggy Pop. Who, that was the coolest day. Um, but we also had Henry Rollins and uh, Moby was in it. Um, anyways, that, that was just a lot of fun to work on. Uh, I would say that the day we had Iggy Pop, we killed Iggy Pop. Yeah. Yeah, Iggy Pop died. They uh, he got his throat ripped open, and it was kind of like Dece early December. Or, no, it was November, late November. It was quite cold, and he I think he lives in Florida or something. Or he's from someplace warm, and we had to ask him to lie down in this alley. He gets killed in an alley, and I was just like, oh my god, we're putting Iggy Pop in this puddle in an alley. And <laughs> but then someone made a joke. It's like, well, it's not. I think he made the joke. It's not my first time lying in an alley. <laughs> so. Uh, made everyone feel better. And and for for those of you, does anyone know who Iggy Pop is out there? Yes, we have one person. Anyway, he's pretty much like a punk rock icon, right? He is. He's the godfather of punk. He's like the Elvis Presley. Undeniably. He's like the. Yeah. In your terms, he's like the Justin Bieber. Oh no. Oh. No. no. <laughs> he's, he's, Maybe a bad comparison. He's like the Katy Perry. Oh, right. No, he's he's nothing like Justin Bieber. He was doing punk rock in 1970 when to hippies, freaking all the hippies out. <laughs> it wasn't even called punk rock back then, though. It's called garage. It's just called garage rock or whatever. But anyways, totally cool guy. It it is cool. I I will share one other anecdote. I, I got to work with Rod, Rowdy Roddy Piper last week, and uh, he was totally cool. He's, that's a, that's an old name from the '80s, but uh, for me that was uh, the yeah, ultimate no, villain. WWF wrestling. Yeah. It's almost like WWF wrestling isn't like it got replaced by UFC. Totally. Yeah. You know, yeah. But Rowdy Rod Piper. What's Rowdy? Rowdy Rowdy Piper. He was the uh, the the big villain in the '80s in wrestling to Hulk Hogan and uh, all those guys on the Giant. But a long time ago. So that was kind of cool to work with him. Uh, that was just last week. So Awesome. So do you, like with your camera department, do you get to sort of choose your guys of who you want to work with? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Usually, uh, you know, on the, the bigger the budgets, uh, the more oversight the line producer and production manager have over your crew. Certainly, people that production doesn't like to work with. It's very hard to get them on your show, so you gotta it's, you gotta get them approved. But um, there's just the odd time where you come into a project late because the other another DOP had to drop out for one reason or another, and so sometimes you inherit a crew. Yeah. Um, and sometimes uh, availability dictates who you hire. There's, you know, you just kind of keep going down your list until you find someone who's available. So, yeah. What, what do you, what, how would you sort of describe? I don't know the qualities of, you know, a, a good first AC or camera operator. Just the, in general, the guys that you like to work with. Um. Is, well, this applies to all crew that I like to work with. Um, they need to be people who are calm. They need to be pe people who are positive. They have to be problem solvers. 
I don't want to. When problems get to me, it better be a, a, a big problem. I don't like. I've got enough problems, so I, I need people who are very self-motivated and experienced, pleasant to work with. You know, I, you know, hours are long. Minimum, minimum twelve-hour days or longer. So it's it's important that you're working with people who have good character, it, as well as they know what to do. Um, people that don't create drama, you know, I don't like. You know, no one no one likes that. The jobs, the days are too long to have any additional stress created by difficult personalities. Right. So. If, if there's going to be one difficult personality, it's like the star, you know, like that. That's the only. I, usually, that's not the case, but sometimes it is. But that's the only person who can have any excuse to be a, a prima donna. Right. Who? Stay on Beauty and the Beast. It, um, that was like I recognized um, her from Smallsville. Right? Yeah, Kristen. Kristen Krug. She yeah. was fantastic. Kristen. Um, was always on set, on time, super helpful uh, with camera department. You know, very technical actor. So she she was very she's she's athletic as well. She's very physically fit, which is it's good to work with actors who are body you know who are athletes because they're very body aware and they can make adjustments that help camera movements or hitting your marks. You know, very easily. So she was super accommodating, and uh, the beauty of having a lead who, uh, you know, like Kristen is, um, she kind of sets the tone, and then all the other cast members and the rest of the set kind of has to fall in line. You know, when number one on the call sheet is sucking it up at hour 13 or 14 or whatever it is, yeah, then no one else can complain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, it's great when uh, when you get to work with someone like that. Very cool. Um, what maybe talk a little bit about your relationship with uh, directors and kind of like how I don't know I guess just what what that's like maybe two different two examples of maybe a director that gave you like tons of free reign or where ton of collaboration than maybe some, another one who sort of kind of dictated more specifically to... Yeah, I mean, there's lots of styles of director out there, and um, I have to, you know, I've, I've had to learn how to adapt to the different styles, and um, So I could give an example uh, of a, there's a TV show I worked on last year. The first director I worked with, we had a meeting, um, some informal meetings before the show started, and just kind of pitched. I kind of pitched him some ideas, and he really leapt at them, um, which was great. Um, you know, he's really supportive, and uh, he supported. You know, we kind of co-pitched these ideas to the uh, producers in the network for the series, and it worked really well. And then um, throughout, like there was just like a great trust between us throughout uh, the first couple episodes we shot together. Then another director came in who um, didn't. He, he he said he want. You know, he he, he kind of respected the show and wanted to keep the style, but then. When it came down to press tax, he just wanted to do his own thing, and that was just really awkward to figure out um, how to deal with that. <laughs> and ultimately, I have to follow what the director says. The director is the uh, you know runs the set. I have to interpret what they say and, and try to you know um, you know achieve what they want. It's a bit tricky in television because. Directors are coming and going with every episode, and sometimes they want to do things a little bit differently just because they want to do things differently, and uh, you know that's a little bit stressful. Uh, but you know, try not to take it personally, and ultimately, it's up to the producers to uh, you know if there's a problem, it's up to the producers to come down on the director. You know, 
So, so between like shooting TV and sort of feature films, the role of the director would you say l less influential on the overall sort of camera look? On Absolutely. TV? Yeah, I mean, the cinematographer on a TV show is supposed to safeguard the visual style throughout the series, so there's a continuity, you know, from episode to episode, and um, ideally season to season, depending on, you know, a lot of DOPs only do a season or two, and then they move on to a sh different show, um, so that, that can change, um, but the, you know, the produce, the directors come and go, and the producers aren't on set all the time, so, you know, the cinematographer becomes the uh, consistent you know, creative eye on set. Whereas in a movie, it's uh, definitely the director is the one who's, um, you know, really trying to keep that consistency of, of tone throughout the show. And that's the tone that comes out mostly in the acting, but it also has to be there in the lighting and the sets and all the design elements of it. Why is that? Why do they change up directors in TV series so much? Is it just availability? Um, I think it's a pra I mean, there's a pragmatic side to it. It's because you've got to prep and then shoot, prep and shoot. So it's not. It wouldn't be possible to shoot too many episodes in a row because you can't prep. You can only prep maybe one or two episodes at a time. On on a show like Beauty and the uh, and the Beast, you can only prep barely prep one episode at a time because the script sort of arrives so late. Um, in the prep schedule. So it's just, there's a pragmatic side, plus producers like different voices to bring different elements to the right. show. Um, also, TV is uh, grueling, and um, I don't know if a, I don't know how well a director would do. Even, I guess some shows they maybe like flip, like there'll be two directors. I think uh, Schitt's Creek did that. Um... On the CBC, they had two directors that alternated. So while one was shooting, one was prepping. Right. So, but, I mean, the movies are much better. I mean, I love films because, you know, it's just me and the director, and, and it's very, you know, we look at stuff, we talk, we have long, con you know, conversations, and you're really getting each other's head. And then by the time you're on set, it's, um, it's like I can finish the director's sentences I'm so inside their thought process with what they want to do with the film, yeah. and uh, it's creatively it's a lot more enjoyable. But uh, so so trust is a pretty pretty huge thing, right? For when you for sure when you're arguing with a or I mean usually you're probably not arguing about something, but just sort of trust me. Let me show you how this works. You're gonna love it. And they go, yeah, I they they. They go along with what, or or the opposite way. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out, but um, you know, you're hired to uh, cr contribute creatively, and uh, any any sensible director will will listen, you know, listen to your suggestions and ideas. And if they don't listen, then um, you know that becomes a problem. Because uh, they'll get themselves, they can get themselves into trouble, you know, with the day, not getting their day, or, um, you know, technical problems, or you know, it's tough. Uh, but you have to listen too, you know, you have to try to get in their head and listen, really listen to them, and not be, you know, I try not to have an ego about things. If uh, someone doesn't like an idea, that's fine, and I'm. You know, I'm, I listen to ideas from my crew as well. You know, my gaffer, my key grip, my operator, focus puller. I listen to my crew. I don't have an ego about where ideas come from. I just want, I just want to do the best idea. Nice, guys. Is there anything coming to your mind? You guys wanted to ask? Yep. Yeah. So the question was, how how does your work come to you? Um, where do these offers, do they just come out of nowhere? Someone looking at your reel online or? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's important to have a reel online. Um, you know, in the beginning it was through uh, 
you know, when I first finished film school, I just did corporate video. It was the only thing I was getting paid to shoot. Otherwise, I made my living as a, in the lighting department. Um, so in the initial beginning, it was just classmates. Any little job they got, I'd, you know, try to shoot for them. Um, uh, f from volunteering on projects, you meet people. Uh, I, did I did some volunteering at the Film Center a long time ago and met a few producers and directors that went on to get paying shows, so um, it's it's a long it's a long process. My I mean my agent calls me. I mean now I have an agent in LA and you know, so they'll call me about stuff that they hear about. So uh, you know, but it's a process to get to that point. Yeah. Is it is it like as soon as you sort of signed on to some of those union shows or the the TV shows, it's like it's not. Do you need an agent? It's like you just have to have one. You get one at that point where you got to negotiate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, certainly when you're doing union shows, an agent will want to sign you because you're making money and they, they, agents want ten percent of it. So. Um, so you, I mean, you got to be careful what you got to sign with a good, you know, an agent that's good for you, and not every cinematographer has an agent though, but most most do. Um, but um, I would say it's more important on focusing on trying to get the work and make the contacts and building your reel, and a good agent will come. Uh, I don't. I think for most cinematographers, an agent doesn't really help your career too much until you already have a career. So uh, with some people it, it definitely helps, but most you need to build your own career first. They want, you know, no one else can build your career. Yep. Good. All right, well let's shift gears and kind of move into some of the technique um, on uh, we, we've got some stills for the kids to look at. And just how we how you lit those and what kind of went into those. Right. Yeah. Let me. Uh... We'll, we'll, what, what we're gonna do is we'll probably we'll go for another fifteen minutes, and we'll take like ten minute break. You guys, go to the bathroom, get a drink or whatever. And then we'll finish up with sort of part two to sort of technique and showing you some of these stills and video clips. And then the very last part where uh, Gregor's will we'll get some comments on our upcoming script that we're going to be shooting and suggestions for lighting and stuff. I'm just going to send you... Can I do that? Okay. I'm just sending you a link. Just to, I found this is behind the scenes clip I found, which um, this one called fifty two fifty three. Yeah, and then there's a behind the two behind the scenes stills. Which might be. Uh, oh. Where is Gosh, I don't have to do that. I guess I can I'll keep the stills here because they'll display fine. It's just the the videos. Um, let's open. Okay. Uh, pardon me while I just uh, pull stuff up. I have uh, 9,000 photos from Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Lots to look through. Um, I pull stills from every, uh, well, tr from every, try pull, have a still pulled from every setup I shoot just as a 
record of continuity and uh, and reference. But I also shoot a lot of behind the scenes stuff for interesting stuff as well. Um, okay, here we go. Here's the tunnel. Now, where that is. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, I see. That's like a panoramic kind of shot. Yeah, there's like a panoramic shot. And uh, I'm just using another monitor here. Oh, that's a huge picture. Five gigs. Oh, is it? Five gigs? Or oh, five megs. No. Okay. <laughs> that is a, say, that sounds like a video clip. Uh, and there's one with a tennis ball? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that was a macro shot. I just thought it'd be kind of funny. Uh, that's Kristen locked in position for a macro shot. Where the heck is this... Uh, Oh, I see their eyeball there in the in the monitor. That's crazy. Uh, <coughs> sorry, just uh, that one clip. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can't find that behind the scenes shot, but um, that's okay. The uh, here I'll switch to screen share here. I've got I've got that that. Panoramic shot of the set, the op, the police station set. Yes, that looks really cool. So that would be. Uh, let me find. Let me just uh, try to find. So that would have been in the. Uh, Okay, here we go. That's weird. Can you see the images on the monitor now? Um, okay, let me switch to that. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, yeah. So here we go. So that image was taken in the. Uh, it's called the bullpen. It was kind of where all the de police detectives would, uh, you know, do all their police talk. <laughs> they would show up and do a little research on the computer and walk in and bring in suspects and anyways. Um, there were adjacent uh, interrogation rooms. I'm trying to find some better uh, stills. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's the bullpen. Um, so you can see uh, it's, these shots are a little bit uh, tighter. There's a wider shot. So out that window there is, that's a translate um, of, uh, it's kind of a photo montage of buildings in Manhattan. And um, above, above the translate we have uh, 10K uh, tungsten Fresnels hung on a track so they can slide uh, left and right depending on the beam angle that we wanted. Right. There's obviously a little bit of haze in the air to create that sunbeam coming in. Right. And the lamps have been gelled um, with full blue, uh, full CTB gel. So we had little frames up there. They had to be replaced every now and again because of the heat would kind of burn off the gel. Um, Those are like 10K lights? Yeah, 10,000 watts, yeah. So we had um, 
four or five of them up there, I think. Wow. At least. Yeah, let me see. There's three windows plus the two on the side. Yeah, there was five, five or sometimes we even have six going because there's side, there's three of these windows with the arch and then there's these little rectangular windows on the side, on either side of the set. This was a 360 degree set with a second floor. So we do steady cam shots through it in and out and there's a hallway adjacent and you go up the stairs and do a loop and it's a pretty cool set. So, and where, where was the studio? The in studio um, is in Etobicoke on, uh, it's just called, uh, it's an old glass factory that they converted to sound stages. Kipling, uh, Kipling Avenue, Kipling in Queensway in Etobicoke. So it's a little bit outside of downtown Toronto, which has great access from the highway and lots of cheap land out there. Um, yeah, the studio is pretty massive. This so set, I think they spent five hundred thousand dollars on it. Oh, how much? I think the set cost five hundred grand. Wow! Just the set, not the lighting. <laughs> and how far back would the the city? The translate. The translate was twelve feet. Maybe it's fourteen. It was twelve to fourteen feet away from the window. Okay. Uh which is pretty standard distance for translites and green screens and whatnot. Um, and then the uh, 10Ks were hung. The ceiling was uh, 20 feet up, so they were, on a, they were hung down from that, maybe three or four feet. Right. And then it was on a track, so you could slide them around. If you wanted the beam to come in more from the left or for the right, you get a little scissor lift up there and slide them around. So what, cool. what would when when would it be the decision to do the windows green screen or like I saw the behind the scenes on um, Gone Girl and they were showing how they were doing green screen replacements for the windows in the houses and stuff like that. Yeah, well on stage um, it's usually a lot cheaper to do translate. Yeah, um, even though this I think. This translate was maybe twenty grand to rent it over the course of the ten month season, um, but twenty grand doesn't buy. You know, you'd be doing constant visual effects work. You know, always need tracking marks there because these yeah. windows are in the shots all the time. Right. And TV, you can't slow down. So translates are just a much more efficient way to work. Yeah. Um, whereas green screen, you know. It's cheap. The less camera movement, the cheaper the composite is, and uh, you know it's just not possible to work that way. We did. I mean, we certainly shot a lot of green screen on this show, but not in our um, any set that was uh, we kept coming back to every episode. You know, we'd have to build in window treatments to make it. And you know, we efficient. actually have glass in there, or. Um. Is there glass? Some a lot of the windows have glass. Yeah. Absolutely, I think this window has glass. Yeah, that most of the windows had glass. They were these ones didn't gimbal. So gimbling is where um, the window can turn left and right and move reflections. Uh, have reflections in the glass. It adds a realism there. You can see in this window here, over uh, here, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yeah. You can see there's a reflection in that glass. It just yeah. adds production value. There's reflections here as well. Right. Um, so whenever possible, you try to have reflections or put bright, out-of-focus stuff in the background. <laughs> you know, it looks sexy. Um, but the, like these windows would gimbal. So if you saw a camera or a light, you could pan them right. so you wouldn't see it. But it becomes very complicated. We always shot with two cameras so panic, gimbling a window for one camera produces problems for another camera so it's you know it's not <laughs> every setup is a new uh, challenge, a new puzzle right. to solve. So when, when you're shooting two camera would both cameras be on one actor or would you Try and shoot. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Ideally, depend. I mean, it depends on 
a lot. Sometimes they want to cross shoot, which is much harder. Um, sometimes they just want two different sizes, which if it's fairly reasonable, like on this show, um, we had, uh, you know, beauty lighting. You know, the the cast were very attractive, and the show, the network wanted a very attractive show. It's not possible to shoot really wide shots and close-ups at the same time. The lighting, you know, wide shot lighting doesn't hold up in a close-up. It's right. very ugly. <laughs> yeah. So when you move into close-ups, all the lighting has to move in. See the nice catch light in her eyes? Yeah. The lighting moves in closer and closer as you move the camera in, and it, you know, there's the, the skin just starts to glow when uh, the light is very close and soft. Right. And so from that, from the wide still image showing, you know, the bounced light. So I'm assuming all that is tungsten lighting. Is that correct? Oh, from that panorama. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder if I have that in here. I've got it right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so yeah, so this is a typical um, setup. Um, there's a camera here on the left. The that's the B camera, and just where this gentleman in the glasses is on further left, that's where the A camera is, and it's about to dolly in. If you view that clip, you'll see the, the shot. Right. So basically, these are, uh, it's called unbleached muslin, which is just an inexpensive fabric, and it has a warm tone. These are 2K blondes that are bounced into it. Right. I bend my bounces to try to, these 4x4, four four, uh, they're called floppy, because they flop. You can see at the bottom, there's like a... a yep. Yep. A loose, floppy part. So I bend it to kind of shape the direction of the light. You can see I've got one here. So this is, it's taking the dramatic heat off of there, but it's, I think a character is going to, uh, I, I think it's just on her. Anyways, this, this other key is set up for another little beat. I, I think she walks in and walks over here. I can't remember the exact blocking, but... Um, yeah, so, I like I like working with bounce light, and this is a kind of in, in a big set. This stuff works. Yeah. So so for you guys, like th these like th those are like redheads, are they? Those two K lights. Yeah, two Ks. Uh, they're blondes, so they're they're just big redheads. Right. Oh, redheads so, are one Ks. Yeah. Same, okay. an open face. So and those those kind of lights, you can get those like on eBay, like super cheap now. Like if you if you just look those up on eBay, like you can buy those one, one Yeah, redheads buy. are the cheapest light you can rent. You know, and he's just you know he's just bouncing them off of this you know white sheets basically while mu muslin. So pure white. I mean, this is a good example of uh, you know this is a big budget show. I could have any fancy light I want. For me personally, though, I like the basics. These are tungsten lights, tungsten open face lights bounced into muslin fabric, which is the cheapest fabric you can buy. It's the fabric that dressmakers use to, like, you know, when they're designing clothes and stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm sure everyone, once you see it, you'll know what it is. Yeah. Um, so it's like a, I mean, they're stretched over these frames that, you know, Matthew's grip equipment makes, but. Um, and these lights overhead are working fluorescence. When they're not in the shot, they go off. You can see in the background here, this one's on because it's in the background of the shot. But it's pretty ugly top light. We wanted beauty lighting, so unless they were in the background, they were turned off. These little practicals are on to create glows. Little TVs are on in the background to create glows. It's really important to have something glowing in the background to create depth and dimension to your shots. You can see there's a pretend like window, blue window hit here. I don't know if you can notice that, but there's like blue there. Right. Um, so I think it's important to have color and to mix your colors. You know, learn a bit of color theory and uh, you know what colors complement each other. Yeah. Yeah. With that, um, so your camera, say your your white balanced to the tungsten then. So yes. 
Your tungsten lights are 3200. Uh, That's your camera's balanced to that. So yeah. Any your like I said, your blue lights coming in, those were tungsten, but you had those gelled. I gelled them, yeah. Yep. And then and that's just because it's cheaper. HMIs um, traditionally is what you'd use for daylight lights um, or Kino flows, but for for that situation, be HMIs. We just couldn't afford them. And um, and that's um, black tin foil you have wrapped around the lights as well. It's called black wrap, yep. and essentially, it's like a thick foil that's painted black and it's heat resistant and it, it blocks all the light leak that comes out between the barn doors and the fixture um, and you get like this hard light leak and you can see here this we use the tungsten practicals this this is a working light this practicals I purposefully put this white paper there it's bouncing up and adding a reflection to her cheekbone okay I mean she's getting a lot of light from this but this is also selling the key and actually adding to it, right. there's a little bit. Of, it's contributing. That's so we, I would use these all the time as little bounces on the paper on the desk. Right. So it's pretty, um, you know, straightforward. I mean, in in this situation, it's obviously there's six k of light here. There's three two k's, and then there's one two k here behind these extras, hitting this bounce. But you know, you can shrink this down and make it work with a 1k bounce over here and then a 1k bounce over there and practicals is everything else. Yeah. So, so this, you know, this gives gives an idea of, I don't know, I guess a lot of people have this or, you know, when we grab a light, we're like, grab one light and aim it at the actor, you know. Whereas yeah. this is creating a more realistic picture of what studio and TV lighting is like. That's like a 15 foot wall of light and it's like yeah, yeah. super soft, super bounce. Does that give you guys an idea of sort of where some of your lighting design might need to go to versus grab the lights and point it at the actor, right? Yeah, if you, I mean this is the clip here. I don't know if this plays but let me go back to. Okay, yeah, we're seeing that. So the dollies. You can see that. You can see that's the A camera tracking in front. Um, and I, I mean, this is my iPhone. I just tracked off the monitor. It's a close up, and, and they're wrapping around her. So basically, in her phone conversation, she looks camera left, which is why I've got the key there. Right. In the still, it looks a little strange. Like why? She's looking straight ahead. It doesn't make sense to have the key there, but um, you can see from this. Uh, how, how the two keys are working. Here, if I can pause this thing. So that bounce on the right is creating this right. highlight here. Right. So she's not staring into a dead, dark zone. And then she's keyed from the left, and she'll turn in the shot camera. You can see now she's turned to the left, and she's in the key. I don't have my... You can't see the shot with the A camera seeing, but... Um, so, I mean, it's important to have multiple sources of light. You know, your actors have to move. They have to change eye lines. Your camera has to move. And um, when, both those when, both yeah. lights were the same temperature... Yeah, they're um, basically uh, they're warmed up because there's diffusion on the barn doors. You can see in the video, there's like a close peg here, so there's diffusion on the barn doors, which softens the light primarily, but it adds a slight warming. But then primarily hitting the yellowy, unbleached muslin fabric. Yep. Warm is not only does it soften the light, but it warms it up considerably. So it's prob I'd say the lighting is probably around two thousand seven hundred Kelvin. Okay. And, um, yeah, and so it's quite warm. And, but you you would leave your camera locked on thirty two hundred. Yeah, I, I want warm, flattering light. This this show was all about beautiful skin tones, uh, beautiful actors, but in a in a realistic, dramatic sense. It wasn't like beauty lighting, like uh, 
for a fashion magazine. The lighting is very naturalistic, but you can see this giant catch light in his eyes. And that's because there's a giant light <laughs> bouncing just off frame right. Right. Yeah. And the same for the reverse angle. There's, you know, it's you can see how undefined the shadow edge is on her nose. Very soft, naturalistic. It just wraps. It's called a wrap light. Yep. Because it wraps around the face. And and again, you're always your your key light is always, or most of the time, on the opposite side of the camera. So yeah, I mean that's called the good, the good side. This, I mean, the slang term is put the key light on the good side, <clears throat> which is where they're looking. Um, so, or keep the camera on the dark side. So the dark side is the shadow side. My camera's, you know, but it's not always possible to do that, um, nor is it always desirable. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is pretty moody. If you want moody lighting, then you've got a key from the good side. Or, or conversely, some people say put the camera on the dark side. You can see my camera's on the... Really, you can tell the <clears throat> dark side here. This, um, I don't know if you can see in his eye, but you can kind of almost make out the bounce. If I uh, open that up in preview. How do I... No, I don't do that. <laughs> How do I move? And... Cool. There we go. There we go. Yeah, so it's hard. I guess the resolution is not good enough, but you can see there's a line there, and that's because there's two bounces that are butted up together. Okay. And those are um, by fours? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Actually, you know what? Probably what it was was um, a piece, two pieces of foam core. In this situation, it's cool light, so in what, what I use in cool light is a product called foam core. Yeah. Uh, which is a white very, very white, kind of a cardboard material. Um, as I, and then the lights are gelled, or I'm just using daylight fixtures that are half-corrected for that cool tone. So, so um, what, when you say daylight fixtures, like a Kino or something 5, like 5,600 uh, degrees Kelvin um, is what's called a daylight fixture. And 3,200 Kelvin is is what's called a tungsten fixture. Right. Um, so usually when you're lighting a set, you'll um, you'll say I need a daylight fixture here or a tungsten fixture here. Um, it's just faster and easier to say than by Kelvin. Um, right. But it's interchangeably. And so when you when you say okay, you're using a that. That uh, daylight fixture. Would you leave your camera set to tungsten? Yeah. So my my camera set to tungsten here. Yeah. And this is probably a half correction because it's not. It's cool, but it's not. Um, it's not as blue as it would be. I think it was full daylight uncorrected. Right. You can see the contrast in the warm light here, especially on. Uh, this skin tone, it's almost reddish compared to our tunnel light, very dark and blue. Right. Um, hey, tell you what. Oh, and there's a bit of green. The, before we get to the tunnel stuff, I see yeah. a couple people getting antsy here. Let's okay. take our break, and let's meet back at 5 after 2. Fantastic. So we'll just leave our thing, our whatever thing open here and uh, good idea yeah okay